Hi, this is Dr. Daniels, and welcome to Healing with Dr. Daniels. You are listening to the Sunday, April 11th edition. Yay! And today's title is How to Transform Fear to Courage, Despair to Hope, and Sickness to Health. Yep, you heard it here. Today, I'm going to simplify my journey um, by referencing a life of an individual who was born a slave in 1833 and achieved worldwide acclaim and fortune. It is my hope that this will inspire you to happiness, health, and wealth. And as always, think happens. So first, update on mom. Yay! Mom continues to do well. We are just totally amazed and thankful she just improves every day and um, it's just really going well so those of you who have old elderly people in nursing homes do not write them off yet I tell you uh, you know it's really possible they can turn around but uh, not in the nursing home so you have to take the big leap huge leap of uh, getting them out but really, uh, she's an inspiration, I think, to us all, actually. <laughs> uh, so that's Mom's Progress. Okay. So the book that I'm reading, this has just been an amazing book. So um, the name of the book is The Beautiful Jim Key. I'm going to show you the cover because it can be hard to find. And so when you find it, you want to yeah. The Beautiful Jim Key. And I picked it up because I heard about this person who was born a slave. Yeah, right, lots of people a long time ago were born slaves. But he uh, was born a slave, he fought in a war, and as a prisoner of war became a millionaire. What, like, really? <laughs> and when the war ended, this is the Civil War I'm talking about, he went back to his slave owner only to find the poor slave owner had lost everything in the war because the confederate of course lost the war and so he bought the slave uh, owner's property back from the bank so the slave owner could live on that property the rest of his life i said wow that's an amazing story there must be more to it i've got to find out about it so i got the book and started reading it and sure enough it is just an amazing not only an amazing book, but is a big, I think, inspiration for the present times that we're going through. Okay, so uh, he was born in 1833. Now, now try and follow this because I know I had to think about it a while to get it straight. And I realized why the families, so many families are so confused and difficult to sort out, like who's related to who. But he was a mulatto, half black, half uh, African and half uh, Caucasian. So his master, his father was also his master and his mother was a slave. Now his master died of drunkenness and he was inherited by his uncle who was not only a kind soul but an incompetent businessman and who owned a very small farm and really didn't have any slaves until he inherited um, Bill Key and his mother and siblings. So not having any children of his own at the time, uh, William's new slave owner, which was his uncle by the way, um, just raised William as a son. And he and his wife went on to have uh, many children but continued to treat Bill as their son. Now, when he was about eight or so, his uncle, which was his new master, fell on hard times. Actually, he'd been on hard times for a while. Um, and the wife said, hey, you know, we've got these slaves here. We're not doing anything with them. And, you know, <laughs> we're, just, we're all poor here going down the tubes. Uh, why don't you lease them out to my brother, who we owe all this, all this money to? So 
he then allowed the brother-in-law to lease uh, Bill, his mother, siblings, and these are the slave siblings, out in payment of the debt. Now, during the 10 years that he was leased out, uh, he uh, gave this some thought. He said, well, you know, this is 10 years I'm being leased out. Might as well learn as many skills as I possibly can. And so he mastered so many really valuable skills. He mastered the skill of healing horses, healing people. And he also made himself this premise. I'm going to read this a couple times during today's show. So it says, something fundamental changed in his sense of self, a shift. Bill vowed to have no masters other than God and himself. And whether his legal status was made free or not, he would become free in his mind and come to be responsible for whatever good or evil befell him. It's an important concept. He decided that he would become free in his mind and, more precisely, be responsible for whatever good or evil befell him. So in other words, if something good happened to him, he would examine what part he had in it. If something bad happened to him, again, he would take responsibility for that. As a, treat them both the same. I think it was Hamlet that said, success and failure are both imposters. And you should treat them both the same. But, but uh, here, Bill, this uh, slave, figured that out uh, for himself. So, what happened after his 10 years of being leased out, the debt was paid, he returned to his master, assessed the situation, and said to the master, look, why don't you let me make as much money as I can with all the skills that I've acquired, and I'll pay all the bills around here, and we'll just make this thing work. And his uh, master said, mm -hmm. sounds good to me. Meanwhile, his uh, siblings, which was his master's children by the master's wife, um, considered Bill to be their brother because he had been so before he left. And so they set to work treating, teaching him to read and write. And meanwhile, though, the war broke out. The war between the North and the South broke out. And so uh, Bill figured out that this war was not worth uh, anyone getting involved in. It was just, the whole thing was just a little bit shady here. And before he could stop them, his two half-brothers, or, or basically, I guess they were his cousins. They were the, his master's biological children by the master's wife. Okay. Uh, they joined the Confederate Army. And he's like, ugh. So he went down and signed up to join the Confederate Army to watch over them, assist them, and make sure they didn't die. And um, he got them non-combat positions based on their ability to read, which back then was a very rare skill. And he basically fought on the side of the South in non-combat positions, again, because he could read and write and had other skills. But while he fought for the Confederate, he helped countless slaves escape to the North to freedom. However, uh, his luck ran out and he got captured. So now he was not only a slave fighting for the Confederates, but he was now captured by the North. And of course, well, they figured on one thing to do with this person, put him, he got to put him to death. Um, so they were going to kill him, but he saved himself because he says, whoa, 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 whoa. I can cook. And so he became the uh, the cook, and he cooked so well that uh, they allowed him to live. Now, you might say, oh, cook, come on. But imagine, you're on the battlefield, there's no proper kitchen, and you've got somebody who's actually cooked food that tastes good. It's like, okay, he gets to live. But he also knew how to play poker, taught himself how to play poker. And so, as the cook, and a very good poker player. He won all of the possessions of the uh, commander of the unit. He ended up owning everything. Owning the guy's um, land, his animals, all of his possessions, jewels, everything. And I guess a, a few other people as well. So what he decided to do, uh, so, so, he had, so he had all this stuff. So he bartered his 
uh, I think he actually started a business too while he was being the cook and winning at poker. But he took his winnings, went to the uh, commander and said, hey, look, here's the deal. I'll forfeit all my winnings to you, the yours, uh, if you give me my freedom. And the guy said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so he uh, got his freedom. He started a horse limit business, veterinary business, and just business after business. And so by the time, he, even before he left the war, before he got his freedom, he had uh, over a million dollars in today's dollars in winnings. But he didn't stop there. He um, started these businesses and he went back home to his master's uh, farm. It wasn't a plantation. This is a very modest uh, slave owner. Um, and he finds his uncle's lost the farm. He's lost the farm. And so he, he, a former slave, he's free now, buys the farm back from the bank so his uncle, his second slave owner, can live out a life in days of comfort and he sends his two brothers, these are the 100% uh, white children of the slave owners. He sends the two of these boys to Harvard, pays her tuition. And he marries four times and he, he sends his brother-in-laws to vet school. Now, a very, very accomplished person. And after he had made um, quite a fortune, he, at that point, had a horse that he had trained. And the horse was doing a horse show and selling horse ornament, among other things. And a person named Mr. Rogers, the son of a wealthy family, and he was the heir apparent to a railroad fortune, uh, wasn't interested in railroads. So what he said was like, you know, I, I just want to publicize, you know, entertainers. And so he, he learned about the wonderful Jim Key, this horse that could uh, do math and spell and give change. And his family, of course, disapproved of this. It's a terrible thing. But he and uh, Bill got together and they toured the country and became famous for this particular horse act. And also, it really was an important milestone in the development of the um, animal rights groups and um, humane societies. Uh, so over time what happens though is the family loses the fortune due to the automobile and the promotion business grows and restores the family fortune. So what can we learn from this? So we have this pivotal person, Bill Key, who born a slave, became a prisoner of war, fought for the Confederate, was a double spy, liberated countless numbers of slaves. And everyone's life he touched, regardless of their uh, complexion, slave or free, whatever, he enriched them. He enriched his owners, he enriched his uh, relatives, his in-laws, everyone in his life. But if we look at his credo, he vowed to have no masters other than God himself and whether his legal status was made free or not, he would become free in his mind and come to be responsible for whatever good or evil befell him. If you listen to that, then it becomes obvious you need only change your expectation and the fear becomes courage. Why? Because fear is just expectations of bad things appearing real. And so if you change your expectations of bad things, then you can have expectations of good things and they can appear equally real. Fear gone. So people ask me, like, like, how do I have so much courage? And of course, I didn't understand the question because I didn't understand that fear was something that's self-generated. It's simply a product of your expectations. So of course, I didn't have expectations of negative or fearful things happening. So I expected and planned so that the things I valued, the positive things, would happen. Now, of course, I had fears. Everyone has fears. And so I arranged my life to avoid those things that I feared. So my day-to-day -day life wasn't filled with any fear. 
Now the next thing is, well, how do you convert sickness to health? How does that happen? Now here is a very important thing. Listen up. This is this is critical. Because <laughs> if you miss this one, it's a biggie. So you got you got to grasp this one. So if you become free in your mind, well, first of all, you have to vow to have no masters other than God and yourself. That's the first part. No masters other than God and yourself. That means you don't accept the doctor or the nurse or the hospital administrator or any of these authority figures as a master. The only master you accept is God and yourself. And if you don't believe in God, hey, that's fine. I get it. At least be your own master. That makes you the master. And then whether your legal status is made free or not, in other words, whether legally you have the status that says you're not free to make your own health decisions. You've got to become free in your mind and come to be responsible for whatever good or evil, whatever health or illness befalls you. Now, if you can do that, you are way ahead of the game, way ahead of the game. So in other words, if you realize that you have no masters other than God and yourself, then you realize that you're not obligated to follow or do what any health individual might tell you, that really the decision is totally yours. Then legal status. So whether there's a law that says you have to take this drug, that drug, this shot, the other shot, or whatever, you realize that that law is not an issue. So whether his legal status was made free or not, in other words, whether the law says he was free or not, he would become free in his mind. That's what you have to do, become free in your mind. And come to be responsible for whatever good, in this case, health, or evil, in that case, illness, befalls you. That goes a very long way. So once you realize that you're the master, and once you realize that you're responsible for whatever health or illness you have, then it becomes like super, super obvious that healthcare, hospitals, doctors, drugs are irrelevant. They don't matter. They don't matter. And laws saying do this, do that, again, they don't matter. Um, and the ultimate responsibility lies with you. This saves you tons of money. So the average American is going to save between $3,000 and $20,000 a year just in health insurance premiums by understanding this itty bitty principle here. Then if you're into research, you can go to my web website, um, listen to the radio archives, anything 2018 and earlier, and it explains to you uh, the death toll from the medical industrial complex. Short story is, at least 40% of all deaths in the United States are caused by interaction with and obedience to the medical industrial complex. So uh, this is an amazing philosophy and it can, for most people, make them pretty darn wealthy overnight. So Bill vowed to have no masters other than God and himself. And whether his legal status was made free or not, he would become free in his mind and come to be responsible for whatever good or evil befell him. And this one thing allowed him to take responsibility and take ownership to such a degree that he was able to become extremely wealthy. He was able to become a famous uh, horse healer. Uh, and they called him Dr. Key, Dr. William Key because he was he healed was a healer for humans and for animals horses in particular alike so this is super super uh, important and I would recommend anyone really get this book now you might say oh dr. Daniels mr. key or dr. key lived in different times and uh, you know, we have so much going on nowadays and life is so complicated. I thought so too. Then I got to this one page in the book and I said, oh my God. <laughs> so
So here it is. This is pretty, pretty uh, brief. So this is 1903. Uh, well, in the decade between 1896 and 1906 alone, human ingenuity created everything from jello gelatin dessert to the engine-powered airplane. So they went from no airplanes to airplanes. The radio was invented in 1896. Electric stove, 1896. We're still using electric stoves today, by the way. Aspirin, invented 1897. Telephone with answering machine, 1898. Anesthesia, 1898. Flashlight, battery operated portable, 1899. Tape recorder, wireless telephone, and you thought cell phones were new. Wireless telephone was around in 1899. Wait, the list, that's only half the list. Radio telephone, the Zeppelin blimp, there were no blimps. 1900, electric vacuum cleaner 1901, electric typewriter 1901, air conditioning which we still use today 1902, crayons 1901, electrocardiogram 1903, silicon, we use silicon everywhere now, invented 1904, animation of motion pictures 1906, and radio amplifier 1906. Now imagine a world without any of those things. None of those things. And then in 10 years, boom, all of those things appear. That's a tremendous transition and a lot of change. And so in that particular time period, it was a tremendous amount of upheaval, just like it is today. And when you read the book, you'll hear political statements that sound just like they sound today. Like, uh, nothing much has changed. And guess what? They got through it back then with a lot of prosperity and happiness and health. And you can too. So that is the, so the big thing that we can learn from this is what we are experiencing today in 2021 in terms of upheaval or change is not something new. Humans have handled it before and you can handle it now. And definitely, uh, certainly reading a book like uh, The Beautiful Jim Key will make it a lot easier for you to be inspired and realize just how capable you are and that you, you really can do it.